welcome. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate that we get to have this opportunity to talk. I'm going to be talking about the eyes. The eyes, vision, and clarity. This has been a personal search of my own from early days. When I was in fourth grade, I had to get glasses for the first time, and I was mortified. I was so embarrassed to have these glasses, especially when I was told that it wasn't really to improve my vision, it was to bring my two eyes into alignment. <coughs> I had a lazy eye, and so I had to bring them into alignment, and glasses was the way that they decided would, would fix that. Well, so I wore those glasses for fourth grade, and fourth grade was miserable. I hated it. And I don't know if it was because of the glasses or not. But then in sixth grade, I had to get glasses to improve my vision. And I thought, why is this? This doesn't make sense. My brothers have perfect vision. Why don't I? You know, it was just this comparison. And there was all this shame and guilt that came about not being able to see clearly. So I realized at a very early age that we have been um, trained to think of ourselves as perfect, which we really are in a deep way. But when I wasn't perfect any longer, then all these emotions came on top of me and I had to deal with them. Gradually over the years, my eyes got worse and worse and worse and worse and I had to get stronger and stronger and stronger lenses, which is the common pattern. Finally, when I graduated from chiropractic school and I started practicing up in Saxons River, I said, wait a minute, something's not right here. My whole purpose of going to chiropractic school was to learn how to heal myself and, if possible, to help others as well. But I really wanted to learn how to heal myself of many different things and my eyes were one of those topics. So I determined that I was going to take off my glasses and not wear them again. Now, I kept them in my car because legally I'm supposed to have glasses on when I'm driving. So if I were to be stopped, I had the glasses right there and could put them on. But I didn't wear them. And I, at the beginning, could not see much further than, oh, you know, five feet away. So it was a risky business at first. But I was determined that I was going to heal my eyes. It has been a long process. It's been 24 years since then. And in the meantime, slowly and gradually, my eyes have gotten stronger and stronger and able to see more clearly. The color has changed from hazel in one eye and green in the other to the current color, which people tell me is blue. I still find it hard to believe because I have green eyes. Uh, you know, that's my self-thought, that I have green eyes, my belief. That was what all my licenses said, that I had green eyes. So it's been an interesting process. I've learned a lot. And I wanted to pass on some of the things that I learned in the process of helping to heal my eyes. Now, I am by no means healed. It's, it's not perfect. I would like to be able to say I have 20-20 vision. I don't. But it's a lot better than it was before. And I can drive comfortably and read signs at a distance and know that I'm a safe driver now, unlike perhaps in the past. And it's been just a fun time for me to be able to explore. All right. Okay. All right, so let's start it out. The first topic is about the eyes. Now, eyes are incredibly miraculous. They are the primary sensory organ in our bodies. We have all these senses, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, tastes, uh, touch, all the different senses that we have. And eyes have the most receptors that go to the brain because they are part of the brain. They are the front of the brain, uh, the forebrain, also called the telencephalon. And the eyes are the first part of the brain that takes the information in. And obviously, people who are blind, who cannot see, develop more sensory receptors in their other organs to make up for not being able to see. But if all is in a normal balance, our eyes are our primary sensory organ in our body. One thing about the eyes that I was amazed of is to realize that we begin to see patterns from a young age. We see the things that we are told to pay attention to. We see them more and more easily. The more and more we groove what it is that we see, the more easily we recognize, oh, that's such and such, or that's so and so. 
And so we groove these patterns, and our eyes begin to filter out anything that doesn't fit into those patterns. As I was doing my healing work, I began to realize that there were sensations that I could pick up from bodies or from uh, areas of the room that didn't fit in with those grooved patterns of what it is that's appropriate to see. So I began to explore that, you know, how can I change my eye's patterns so that I can see more things, notice more things, and actually be able to interpret them. The purpose of eyes is to bring this information into the brain so the brain can make an interpretation of it, and then our bodies can respond to whatever that information is. So again, anything that was considered extraneous would have been filtered out, and what I was attempting to do was remove those filters so that I could begin to gather that information in again and learn to see in a different fashion. Okay, so eyes, it's not about age. We're all taught that, oh, by the time you reach your 40s, you're going to lose your close-up vision or something along in that line. Oh, it's, it's normal, normal aging. Or we think of, uh, you know, everybody around us uh, might have glasses or it might be coming commonplace to have uh, various issues with the eyes, macular degeneration, or to have uh, floaters in the eyes, or to have um, uh, surgery to remove cataracts. These are becoming very, very common in our society. It doesn't mean that that's normal, okay? That's just what is a result of the way that we have been taught to live. And any of us can intervene and say, wait a minute, that's not the path that I want to go down. I want to improve my vision. Um, I'm going to be giving some uh, descriptions along the way of books and things that are helpful. And so uh, that's on that one sheet of paper. We'll talk about that in a, little, in a few minutes. Um, but in the meantime, let's just talk about what the eyes are supposed to be doing. So there's many, many, many functions that the eyes have. I'm going to talk about five or six or seven of them, okay? The first one is eyes as a receptor for light. And I mean any kind of light. Sunlight, moonlight, starlight, no moon, no stars, clouds, light. So our eyes are designed to bring light in to the brain so that we can then know where we are in space so that we can see movement in, even in the dark. And the rods are the ones that are in charge of that. Now, we've all probably had health or science class in the past where they talked about the rods and the cones, and probably all of us have forgotten along the way what they all do. The rods are the ones that pick up dim light information. And of all the receptors that come into the brain from the eyes, one book says that there are 137,000 receptors, photoreceptors, in each eye. 137,000 is a lot. Um, of that 137,000, 130,000 of them are rods. Only 7,000 are cones, okay? So obviously it was important to ancient humans to be able to see at night, okay? Whether we were outdoors, whether we had a fire there or not, it was important to be able to see in dim light. And so we have many, 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 many more rods to help us to be able to see. Modern times, we have lighting on, daytime, nighttime. We only turn off the lights maybe when we go to sleep. Some people keep their TVs on. Some people have their uh, clock right there with big light, uh, or they have their computer on, and there's all the different lights on at night. So oftentimes, people don't even sleep in the dark. So we've gotten unaccustomed to using those rods, and they are beginning to go not, not really dormant, but they're not being utilized properly. However, you can reactivate them. The uh, easiest way is to start going outside at night and taking a walk without a flashlight. You know, don't bring along a light source. And at first, you'll feel blind. You know, be careful going down the steps. 
because at first you'll feel like, oh, where's that step? I'm going to miss it. Uh, and you have to really, you know, walk carefully at first. But the more that you scan around and get accustomed to that dark, your eyes get accustomed to it, your pupils open up more, and you begin to sense more things that you might have not seen otherwise. Similarly, in the evening time, indoors, it's a great idea for your eyes to start dimming the lights. After you've done dinner, after you've done whatever essentials you need to do in the bright light, dim them for an hour or even two before you go to bed. And even turn them off if you can, so that you learn you know, to navigate through your house without needing to have the lights on. I have uh, the father of a good friend of mine was considered legally blind when he was in his late 70s and 80s. And they had to move three times during that process. And I couldn't get over how quickly he was able to find his way through the new environments, even though he was using canes and you know having to walk very carefully. Legally blind, he was not able to see well at all and yet he could begin to discern very quickly where the furniture was and where the pathways were. So we can do the same thing. It also helps you sleep better if you don't have the bright lights on up until the time you go to sleep. So that's eyes as light receptors. Now eyes as color receptors and visual acuity, that's where the cones come in. The cones, those 7,000 photoreceptors per eye, are in charge of seeing color. Oh, there's a green, there's an orange, there's a red, there's a burgundy, you know, whatever colors it is, that's the cones that are telling you that. And they also are the ones in charge of the acuity process of how clearly do you see what it is that you are seeing. Um, now, you probably have all noticed that our society has this strange thing about color in my opinion, it's strange, where uh, red is a fire truck, but red is a person who has carrot-colored hair. And red hair and red fire trucks are not the same thing. We have these words for colors that don't really make a lot of sense. And I've seen lots of little kids when they are learning to read and you know they have these little books and okay this is the color red, this is the color blue, this is the color green and some of them are genuinely confused as to why is that that color when this is not that color and yet we call them the same word. So just be aware that our, our words can be confusing in how we determine it. Now in the color zone, there's also the genetic issues of people who might be colorblind or partially colorblind. Uh, I had a friend who had a cat. His cat was bright orange like a pumpkin and he could not distinguish his cat in the summertime when there was green grass and his cat was outside. And I couldn't fathom how could you not see your orange cat in the green grass, but those colors genetically blended together and became one color to him, and he couldn't see that. So whenever you are you know, pointing something out, be aware that each person may or may not have the same color sensitivity that you have, and so their terminology may be different. Uh, even just you know, pointing out that car over there, is that silver, is that gray, is that platinum, is that you know, whatever color is it, that we all have these different ideas of what a color is and what it isn't. I also found in my past, when I had the hazel and the green eye, that each eye saw differently with color. That I would close, cover one eye, and everything would have a particular hue that was more bluish at the time, and the cover the other eye, and it would have more of a rosy golden hue. Now they both balanced out, but you might play with that yourselves and see, do you notice any difference between color differentiation of your eyes? Now with color, there's also the old phrase, the common phrase of uh, looking at life through rose-colored glasses, which I always thought meant referred to a person who was happy. I didn't know if that's what it meant, but that's kind of how people talked about someone who would look through life, look at life through rose-colored glasses. 
And it wasn't until I started working with colored glasses that I began to realize that it really does affect how you see things. Now, these are all colors of the spectrum. I'm going to pass them around so you can play with them. The yellow ones make things very bright and warm. And when you're wearing the yellow ones, hang on just a minute. I'm going to hold one up so that everybody can see against the wall. So that's an example of a nice yellow warm color. Uh, I have found in my own practice that people who have SAD, the seasonal, uh, seasonal affective disorder where they feel depressed in the wintertime, uh, yellow glasses make them feel as if the sun is shining. It's a wonderful, simple gift for helping the body to feel happier in the wintertime if that's an issue for you. There's other colors that are good to check out. This is kind of a, what, raspberry red, something to that effect. Again, your terminology will be different, possibly. Um, and those are amazing if you'll try these when they come around to you. That the raspberry red or the, um, it's almost like um, indigo. This one is not indigo. Or that raspberry red one is different from regular red. And here's a violet. When you try them on, you'll see that wearing a certain color brings out different colors. So if you had these and look at a person's water bottle, their bottle is going to look at a very different color. Or the clothing, clothing will be very different. And it changes how your brain feels because it literally is changing the vibration of the light that's coming in through your eyes into your brain, which then affects everything. All the messages that come into the brain through the eyes affect the hypothalamus almost instantly. And the hypothalamus is one of the major organs for uh, running the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system is your peripheral, I'm sorry, your um, sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. Those are the things that happen automatically in your body. The sympathetic nervous system is when you have your fight or flight response when you know you got to get out of here or you're going to blow up. That, that type of adrenal reaction. That is modified by the hypothalamus. Similarly, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the counterbalance for the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system helps you to relax, helps you digest, helps you to sleep. And that's also run by the hypothalamus. So what you bring into your eyes and the color vibration that you bring into your eyes can affect your hypothalamus, which then affects your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous systems, which affects your heartbeat, affects your digestion, affects every function of your body. And they also affect your hormonal glands through the pineal and the pituitary glands. So everything can be affected by what it is that you're looking at and what it is that you're perceiving. Um, I find that the blue glasses, I have both the gels and the glasses here, I'm holding on to too much. The blue glasses, thank you, are very cooling and soothing for the brain. So if a person tends to be stressed, tends to be high blood pressure, tends to be um, thinking too furiously, the blue glasses seem to chill them out and relax them. Uh, and again, it's not that you have to go around all the time wearing these very strikingly uh, fashionable glasses, <laughs> um, but it is, thank you, you can take that and pass those around for people to try. Um, but it is something that is worth wearing once or twice a day uh, for 15, 20 minutes or to put on when you realize, oh, I'm in this mood and this state and I need to change that state. A very easy way. You know, you could meditate or you could do some exercise to jazz up one or the other, uh, or you could put on a pair of glasses and keep on doing what you're doing. So keep in mind, there's simple ways of using color to help to affect your mood and how your brain is functioning. So gradually those are going to be passed around and you can just check them out and see how they feel for your eyes. 
I'm going to go on and talk about eyes as receptors of distant information. Now again, in the early days and for most of humans' life on this planet, we needed to be able to see at a distance in order to know what was coming into our world. We had to be focused on something that was further than, you can also take them out and just pass them around one by one. Um, we had to be able to notice what was coming into our world because it was going to affect us. So people had lookout points that they would stand on and they would have relay people to pass that information on. And people needed to have clear eyesight, clear vision in order to gather that information. So distance vision is something that was very important to humanity in our history. And in recent times, it's again going by the wayside because we're also focused on reading books or Kindles or ebooks and computers. So we're all doing this close up vision work and rarely doing the long distance vision work. Or if we are, it's with wearing glasses at the same time to correct for the long distance vision. So it's a good thing to begin to work with your own eyesight with that. When you are sitting at a computer, uh, when you're reading a book, whatever it is, make sure to frequently stop, look out a window, look at the trees, look at the vehicles going by, look at whatever scenery is out there, and let your eyes go out to that direction to bring in the information. Very relaxing. It also allows the eyes a chance to blink. Uh, it's been studied and shown that people blink far less when they are doing computer work and also less when they're reading, but the computer work is much less. And we need to blink. We need to blink frequently because that's how the water soothes the eyes, it moisturizes the eyes, it brings new fresh uh, nutrients to the eyes. So again, make sure that when you're at your computer, you stop and you blink frequently to let your eyes relax, to chill out. You know, it can be frequent blinking or it can just be regular. Make sure to do it. Now, the other thing about distant information that when we are in our uh, pattern of looking up close, because of the muscular activity, it changes the shape of our eyeballs. You look distance, you look close up, it changes the shape. And when you are looking close up, it makes the eyes, makes the light go on to a different area of the retina. Now that all light, if you have visual acuity, should go on to the fovea of the retina, fovea centralis. It's the place on the retina where you're supposed to be able to see the most clearly. If because you have consistently been reading or reading in poor quality light or on a computer screen that is too bright or whatever it is, um, your eyeball shape can change and then the light no longer hits the fovea and it hits some other part of the retina so you don't see as closely, as, as clearly. Uh, and so that's where corrective lenses are used to help to change the shape of the lens to accommodate where the light does hit in your eyeball. So one of the natural ways, alternative ways, rather than using regular corrective lenses, is pinhole lenses. So there's a few of those passed around. They also make them in half sizes for a reading glass size, and those have larger holes in them. And the pinhole glasses change how the light comes in and hits your uh, fovea. So without wearing corrective lenses, you can see something. So for example, here I've been working on my eyes all this time. Um, whenever I would go to the annual Super Bowl party and there would be, you know, a couch in a long room and then a t television at the far end of the room, I couldn't read the light or, you know, read the small words up above, you know, where are they, what are the scores, what's happening. But if I put, put these on, I was able to read it perfectly clearly. So they're a fun thing to play with. Uh, I did put up an eye chart up here, or a version of an eye chart. And when these come around, take off your own glasses, see what you can see without your own glasses, put these on, see what you can see with these. It takes a few moments for your eyes to adjust to seeing through the pinholes, because otherwise at first you just start seeing you know, all these holes and you can't kind of get past 
pass to get through the holes. You're just blocked by what's there. All right, so pinhole glasses can retrain your muscles and change where the light hits on your fovea. Um, the next topic is eyes as scanners of energy and information, vibration. So again, with distance vision, we have the ability to know, is that a person, is that a deer, is that a car? Thank you. Um, what is it that we need to be aware of that's out there? But the tendency for us, since we are so focused on close up, is that we've lost that ability. Even if you can't see the item clearly at a distance, you can often see the sense of what it is, whether it's made from wood or glass or metal or a living animal or a tree um, or a person. So begin to open your eyes at a distance and scan and see if you can tell, even without your glasses, what it is that's out there in your distance because that information is something that is genetically geared into our bodies, into our eyes, to be able to see and perceive that. In close-up realms, one of the things I've found in the healing work that I do is that I've been able to teach myself how to see vibrations, uh, energies, emotions of people. And we all know how to do that. It's in all of us. As children, that's how we learned how to be safe, is that we would notice if a person had energy around them or you know, some type of body posture that was of anger or was of love. Uh, we could tell the difference. You can feel the difference as to whether a person is feeling safe and good to you or whether it's somebody who you would really like to go to your room and stay safe that way. So find how to reawaken within yourself that scanning ability. When you're doing it up close, you can literally just scan, you know, looking at the people one by one by one by one and see if it's almost like in the after image. You do your scanning and somewhere along the way you get the information into your brain. It's like it, it, uh, the scanning is the process, uh, the, the seeing, and then your brain interprets what you just scanned. And the brain may interpret it as an emotion. It may interpret it as an energy, a um, you know, daggers, um, puppy love. Uh, there are many different ways of interpreting it. And so that's something that you have to explore and learn. How does your brain interpret whatever energy it was you saw? When I first started uh, opening that process, when I was just taking off my glasses to learn how to see, I realized that I would see something that I would just call static over an area of a person's body when I had them in the office with me. And, and static didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know what to do with static. But at least I recognized that there was static there. And gradually over time, I worked out, developed different ideas as for me, the practitioner, how to help to clear that sense of static that I got from that area of their bodies. But we can all do that within our own eyes. The eyes as messengers to the brain now all of this is coming to the brain and the eyes are bringing these ideas and this information into the brain. So with peripheral vision, we often need to get information from our eyes that we might not have seen directly. As an example, um, suddenly there's this thing and you go like that. And you suddenly, afterwards you realize, oh, that had a buzzing sound, oh, it must have been a bee or a wasp, and oh yeah, there it is, flying away but your body knew to move. And your ears, your eyes, your body all work together in concert to make that reaction of protection, getting out of the way and protecting yourself. Um, so that is peripheral, peripheral vision, working with the rest of the body to inform the brain of a potentially dangerous situation in this case. It could be the same whether you are walking in the wintertime and uh, suddenly something tells you that there's an icy patch ahead and you begin to walk slowly and differently to get yourself prepared to walk over that ice without slipping and falling on it. So all these different things come from our peripheral vision. We might be looking elsewhere, talking to somebody, be totally distracted and yet when the body is working well, all of that works together. So peripheral vision, uh, you put your hands out in front of you 
and wiggle your fingers while looking straight ahead, not looking at your fingers. And then go ahead and begin to move your hands further and further back. And notice where or when, still looking straight ahead, that you don't see your fingers on the side wiggling at you. And many of you, looks like you have good peripheral vision, uh, and some of you are not so good, but it's all how do we train our eyes. You can practice that on a regular basis, you know, see if it's visible down below, see if it's visible up above, and other ways to help to bring that peripheral vision back into focus are that, slowly stretching that, and you know, you can do it one side at a time, making sure that you're looking ahead and you're seeing on the one side and then you're seeing on the other side, one side and then the other. And you're still looking ahead, but it's like the information still comes in sideways into your eyes. Another way of helping to expand peripheral vision is to take an object and I'll use a pen. This has a nice bright orange around it, so I'm going to focus on that and I'm going to put it way up at the top and then I'm going to follow it as slowly as I need in order to follow it around and I notice that there are some places over there that I'm jerking. Uh, my eyes are jerking, it's not smooth. So I want to actually follow it smoothly and if there's any other places where it's jerking then I want to go back over it and do it again slowly in those places. And so you can see that the eyes have the ability to move all the way around. It's not something we generally do in our normal everyday life, but it is something that really helps muscularly to improve all those muscles of your eyes so that you are able to go in any direction. And you can also do it that way. You can go out and in and out and in and down and in and down and in um, and you know up and down and sideways so there's many different ways but it's a good thing it makes a big difference when you go to take your driver's, driver's test um, and it helps to be able to have that peripheral vision for your own body's health and balance. Okay so the last topic is the eyes as reading devices to inform the brain. So the reading devices are actually the least important of the eye's uses. It's just what we have been indoctrinated with. And the eyes as reading devices to inform the brain are a wonderful gift. Obviously we all learn incredibly well and humanity as a whole is expanding exponentially because of this ability to absorb information through the written word. However, it is the newest development and the least important development in the eyes structure and function. So just be aware that in the past um, when pe people would read there would be there were different ways of, of teaching reading. Uh, I was raised where we taught it, we learned it letter by letter by letter and so I learned to read letter by letter by letter. What they found later recently with phonics is that it's better to have groups of sounds of words that you learn to read by and then I got that typoglycemia thing in the, in the email. Did everybody read that one? Yes. I was floored that I could read that because I was definitely one of those people who said spelling is very important. You need to spell the words correctly so people can know what you're writing. And then I learned, no, that's not true. As long as you have the first letter and the last letter of the word and a rough amount of the sounds or syllables, your eyes can actually distinguish in context what it is that those words are with jumbled letters. So we can see that this whole idea of dyslexia may not necessarily be as big of an issue as it has become in our society in the way that we teach spelling and the way we teach people to read. If you have two letters reversed, that may not be that big of a deal in terms of people being able to understand what it is you're trying to say or write. Then, of course, when I was a child, I had heard about Edgar Cayce from my mother and was totally fascinated by his way of learning, that he would take a book 
This is after he was learned how to um, do a lot of the things that he did as a psychic. But he would take a closed book, put it under his pillow, and go to sleep at night, and he would wake up in the morning and would know everything that was in that book. That's not the common thing, but I like to think that I could do this. And then I was thinking one day, well, you know, I have this whole, I had this whole bookshelf, three, four bookshelves of books that were in my lending library at my office. And very rarely did I have the time or energy to read these books. And yet somehow it felt like I knew what was in them. I'm sure if I actually read them that I would learn a lot more details than the general knowledge. But it, it really does, there's something to it that you know what books you need to have around you or you can know what books you need to have around you. And on some level, you are able to take in that information in a way that is helpful for you. We're going to look at the books and products for vision improvement that you might find of interest. The Better Eyesight Without Glasses is a classic. This is uh, William Bates. W.H. Bates, and he wrote this a long time ago, and it still is just as applicable today as when he wrote it. So I highly recommend that. Um, Take Off Your Glasses and See by Jacob Lieberman. Uh, again, an excellent book. Um, can I pass these to someone? Thank you. Seven Steps to Better Vision. These are all ones that just came into my uh, whatever purview and jumped out of the bookshelves at me type of thing. Uh, how to improve your ch child's eyesight naturally. Thank you. And light medicine of the future. Uh, this is by the same author as the earlier book, Take Off Your Glasses and See, but he talks a lot more about the various different um, studies that have been done uh, using color, um, how to use light as a healing modality rather than just as a, um, you know, something that's in our, our space. He talks about the studies using uh, different colored lighting and different colored walls in schools and in prisons and how it affects people's emotions. So it's a fascinating book. The Natural Vision Improvement Kit uh, is something that is also very helpful. Um, this person was legally blind and came up with many exercises um, on his own to help to improve his vision and was able to do so. Uh, this was even though he had had many, 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 many surgeries. Uh, so the, between the surgeries, being born blind and then improving through his own exercise and works, uh, this is a great thing to check out. Then the color therapy glasses, I pass those around. Color therapy glasses is one of the uh, manufacturer's names for it, but there are many different. If you go online and Google color therapy glasses, you will see not only those that are in red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, but you'll see ones that are in every single shade that is possible. Um, and so they're different shapes. They make them aviator style. They make them this old fashioned style. They make them many different styles nowadays. And so you can pick and choose which colors feel good to you and which ones you want to work with. Uh, vision training um, is the pinhole eyeglasses. Each of those uh, eyeglasses has a kit that it comes in and there's a pamphlet that's called vision training. And that particular company is the one, uh, Natural Eyes is the name of the company that makes those pinhole glasses. Again, you can order them online. Um, and they make the full size for distance and the half size for reading glasses. Uh, but you can use either for either. It just depends on the shape of your ears and how much you tilt your head and all that kind of thing. Um, the ones for the half glasses actually have larger holes in them so that you can uh, see better when you're reading. Because if you notice with the pinholes on, it may sharpen your vision, but it cuts down on the amount of light that is available. And so it makes it harder to read uh, if there's not good lighting around you. Okay? Um, structures of the eye, I just gave a list there in case you wanted to 
talk with your own body about what it is that's going on in your body. There's the list of the anterior uh, part of the eye and the posterior part of the eye and the eye socket and all the different portions of the eyes that are there. And feel free to look them up in a dictionary or online and see what it is that each of those different portions of your eye does for you so that you can become more aware of your eyes and why, you know, how can you heal them, what can you do for them. So the chemical support of the eyes is the focus for this little section here. Whether you have floaters, whether you have um, uh, astigmatism, whether you have, um, my brain's going blank, cataracts, or whether you have uh, glaucoma, or whether you have macular degeneration, all of those things are very much affected by your diet. So chemical support for the eyes is really the primary issue that you need to be aware of. Um, the eyes are incredibly sensitive and have these tiny, tiny blood vessels in them that give the nutrients that the eyes need. If the nutrition in the bloodstream is not as good as it should be, could be, then your eyes pay the price first. Um, you begin to have blurry vision, you begin to not see as well, or the beginnings of the lens clouding up begin to happen. So uh, the main things, when I looked those different eye diseases up, everybody had the same thing to say, uh, that it really is about having a clean diet. So diets should be good, very rich in vegetables, especially the dark green, the orange, the brightly colored vegetables. Um, it should be very rich in the darkly colored fruits. Um, it should be low in dairy products, low in alcohols, low in fried foods, fatty foods, um, hydrogenated fats, um, certainly no rancid fats. Um, and just really making sure that it's as clean as it can be. Additives, uh, flour products, uh, those types of things can gunk things up and make it so your blood quality is not as good and then your eyes are affected by that. All the major diseases that contribute to eye problems are dietary related. So whether it's cardiovascular disease, uh, atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries, um, diabetes, uh, oh, let's see, what else? The high, high triglycerides, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. All of those things are very much handled or can be handled by diet. But again, our normal approach in this society in these days is to just send some pharmaceuticals in to control the levels of those different readings. It doesn't correct the underlying problem. So if you can change your diet, you can correct that underlying problem and actually improve those other issues as well as supporting your eyes. Supplements, so I'm gonna just read this list, you have it there, but supplements that are available, they found that the vitamin C with bioflavonoids is essential. Uh, vitamin E is very important. It can be the mixed tocopherols usually. Uh, either beta carotene or the mixed carotenes Trace minerals, I'm a high proponent of trace minerals. We have far too few of those in our diets usually, but especially the trace minerals that are zinc, selenium, and chromium. There's a lot of different herbals, lutein, zeaxanthin, eye bright, bilberry, ginkgo biloba, gentian root and other bitter herbs, grape seed or pine bark extract, hawthorn, chaparral, fish oils, DHA ones in particular, the v, B complexes, especially vitamin B2, B3, and B5, alpha lipoic acid is what ALA is, uh, evening primrose oil, like the abbreviation, <laughs> evening primrose oil is EPO, barley grass, inositol, NAC, and then liver herbs like dandelion, burdock, yellow dock, multivitamins, and taurine. So those are a lot of different supplements and they make combinations that are specific to the eyes. There's Accudine 2, there's um, Accu Plus, there's uh, you know, a number of different combinations that different companies make. 
And the best thing is to see, it doesn't mean that you have to have all of these. I'm not a proponent of you taking everything under the sun just because it was on a list. But the best thing is for you to read about them or go feel them, you know, go to a grocery store or a health food store or a whole food store and look at the shelves that are for eye support and see if any particular bottle just kind of attracts you to it, that there's something about that bottle that when you scan it says, yeah, I could help you. And so then hold it, see, read it, learn more about it. And if it feels right, go ahead and start taking it and then give your body some time. Try it for two or three months. Don't just try it for a week so that you can see if it really does seem to be making any difference for you and for your eyesight, your vision. Uh, the liver herbs, the reason I bring that up specifically is that the tendency um, are in Chinese medicine, the eyes are connected with liver. I've also found for my body that it's connected to spleen. So both liver and spleen uh, can be so supported by different herbs and that supports the blood quality which in turn supports your eyes. So there's many different ways of looking at these different supplements and seeing which ones are right for you. Uh, if you do any type of dousing or muscle testing that would be an excellent way of finding out exactly what you need and how often come to the next class and I'll teach you how to muscle test if you don't know how. Um, eye rinses are wonderful, especially if you have dry eyes or itchy eyes or you get gunk in the corners of your eyes or you have floaters. Those four in particular are really uh, in need of eye washes. Uh, and I was taught and raised not to put anything in my eyes. Of course, I did put my fingers in my eyes, and as kids, that's the most common way of getting infections in the eyes, uh, because your, your fingers aren't clean, and then you rub your eyes and, you know, just dig away at them, especially if they're itching or if they're scratchy or something like that, and then all kinds of dirt or organisms can get into the eyes. Um, so the eye washes are wonderful. You can start with just simple saline water. Uh, saline water, they also make the pre-made salt water drops. But with all of the pre-made drops, just be aware of what is it that is preserving it. Um, it's best to avoid anything that has thimerosal in it as a preservative, which is a mercury derivative, and not a good idea to put something that has mercury in it into your eyeballs. So uh, what you can do is make up a saline solution and use one of those little plastic eye cups, and you put it in there, and then you do this type of thing and take it down and then blink out the excess water or you can just have a little uh, dropper bottle that is clean and clear and you put the saline water in that and when you're lying down you just hold open your lids and put in two drops and put it back into the bottle and put it in wherever you want to keep it. So the saline water is a good way. There's a number of different teas that are very helpful for washing the eyes. They are teas that are either astringents, which means they pull out things, they uh, cleanse, pull out things in the blood, um, and they also will help to flush out any toxins that are on the eyes themselves or under the eyelids. There's agrimonia tea. That's one of the things that I've used regularly, and the reason I was using it was because it also has anti-organism properties. So it's an antibiotic, antifungal, antiparasitic, anti-yeast, and you just make a very diluted tea and then use that in a dropper bottle, keep the rest of it in the refrigerator until you are ready to replenish your bottle. Um, and if you, you know, hold it up to the light, two, three, four weeks later and you see that there is something floating around there, toss that, clean the bottle, you know, boil it and put in fresh from the refrigerator then. So agrimonia tea is excellent for pulling out anything. Uh, like for me personally, I found that the floaters that I have had all my life, I remember as a child going on driving trips and when it would be boring because we'd been driving for hours and hours and hours, then I would just look out the window and start following those little floaters and seeing what the floaters were doing because it was something that was past the time. So like I say, I remember having floaters when I was a child and yet when I look at the books and hear about floaters, they say it's all about a sign of aging. Um, my guidance for my own body has said that it's not aging. Obviously at five I wasn't already aging dramatically, 
um, but it's about what was in my eyes and that I had some organisms in my eyes that when I started using the Agrimonia tea, it was shocking how much stuff would come out of the corners of my eyes in the morning when I woke up. I would do it before bed and in the morning I'd have to clear out all this gobs and gobs of pus that had come out. So it took a while, it took me probably six months before I was done with Agrimonia tea for a while and then I switched to something that was a little more soothing and not quite so um, anti-organism based. Um, so then there's turmeric tea. Uh, turmeric tea is also anti-organism based, um, but it's also a cleansing thing. Turmeric is one of the Indian herbs that is used for all kinds of cleansing and healing. Uh, and you just, again, take about a teaspoon of turmeric and put it into a couple of cups of water, uh, hot water, and just let it steam and uh, you know, soak, simmer and then you strain it and make sure you get all the pieces of turmeric out because that will irritate your eyes otherwise. So strain it very, very well, cheesecloth, double layers, whatever you need to do, and then you use that liquid to put in your eyes at night. Fennel tea or red raspberry tea are two others that are much gentler and they are really just for refreshing the eyes and cooling them and soothing them. So you can make fennel tea or red raspberry tea and do that. There's also a tincture made by Dr. Schultz, uh, S-C-H-U-L-Z-E, it's written down there, and his tincture is Eye Bright, and it's a mixture of many, many different herbs. Um, it also has cayenne in it, and uh, it's meant to be, well, he sells it both ways, to be taken internally and also to be taken diluted into an eye. And it will create, because of the cayenne, it will create an instant tearing effect, which helps to wash out a lot of things. It helps to bring the blood vessels, uh, to cleanse what's in the blood vessels again. And then there's also homeopathic eye drops. Similisan has some great eye drops. They used to have one specifically for cataracts called Cataract Care, though that one if just recently I see it's not being sold now, so I don't know why. Uh, but they have uh, allergy eye drops and um, computer eye drops, red eye eye drops, I, there's many different types, pink eye eye drops. Um, and then the King Bio has homeopathic sprays. 